because I would hate to forget to do that. <laughs> <laughs> go. Tom, are you okay if we get started? Or would you like for me to give folks a couple more minutes? I'm totally okay getting started. Okay. That sounds good. Let me pull up my information here about our session two, just as we're kind of talking through the details of our time together. I've got a couple more people that I'll admit into the waiting room real quick. So let me admit those folks. Awesome. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this fourth series of virtual conversations that we have been providing for leadership educators. My name is Abby Prince. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Program Quality and Management at Leadership, and I'm in the home office, my home office here in Central Illinois um, for this session. I know so many of us are still virtual. Our guest facilitator is not. Um, he is actually in his office um, on the campus, and we'll um, turn things over to um, Tom in a couple minutes here, but I just... Um, I wanted to share with you that you're in good company as you think about how you've joined us for this session today. We've had over 950 people register to engage in the first three series that we hosted so far. Um, and then here we are back finishing up round four of the virtual um, series. So the purpose of our time together is to share questions, thoughts, and best practices as we continue to reimagine how we deliver engaging leadership programs to students through virtual platforms. I think that since we've all been using virtual platforms since about March of 2020, we're all experts on everything that is listed in this slide here. But I thought in case anyone does need a refresher on Zoom, if you need to change your name or your pronouns as they're listed there, please feel that you can do so. Because we have an hour together, I would ask that you keep your cameras and microphones off until, um, unless you have a question that you can't share in the chat. But please feel that you can share questions and comments and um, words of wisdom or thoughts that just came to you in the chat features related to our topic here today as well. And we will do our best to respond to those. I would like to offer, and Leadership would like to offer a land acknowledgement just by acknowledging that the land each of us is on today is the original homelands of indigenous and tribal nations. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from these territories, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land. Please honor and acknowledge the native and indigenous peoples from the land where you are joining us from and give thought to your ancestry and the generations that came before you. Leadership's vision is a just, caring, and thriving world where all lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible. And our mission then is to transform the world by increasing the number of people who lead with integrity and with a healthy disregard for the impossible. It's no small task, and I'm glad that we've got a dedicated community of people that help us do that, that remain committed to those as well. I'm so lucky to be joined by <laughs> Dr. Tom Seeger today from Indiana University of Pennsylvania and talking about this topic of lessons learned, learned from leading leadership educators. Um, and so Tom, I wondered if you would just like to do a little introduction of yourself. I know everyone's been able to read your bio in the meeting invite um, for this session, but um, please just say hello and introduce yourselves to the group. Sure. Well, hello, Abby, and, and hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tom Seeger. I use pronouns he, him, and his. For, it's an honor to have you, Abby, like right here on the screen for real. So let me just name that and just share that I currently serve as the Vice President for Student Affairs um, at IUP, as we refer to it. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that just engage in um, this time to talk about some lessons I've been very blessed to learn and working with some amazing leadership educators in my career. Fantastic, thank you, Tom. I really appreciate that, you're so kind. Um, I just want to, as we're kind of kicking off today and just thinking about who's in this virtual space with us. So I'm thinking about um, gathering some data from all of you. We've developed a couple of polling questions for you to respond to. So let me first pop up this first poll question and asking, do you offer leadership series for first year students only? Yes, no, or perhaps that's not applicable. 
So take a couple minutes to respond to that. Or not minutes, seconds, really. That's an easy question to respond to. <laughs> okay. The vast majority of you have responded to that. This is like watching popcorn in the microwave that like a couple seconds go by and no one's responded. We get that popcorn out of the microwave. So um, it looks like for most of you know, you don't offer a leadership series for first year students only, which is good. It sounds like you've got a broad audience there, which is nice. I will share our second poll question here, which is that you offer leadership series for transfer students only. Yes, no, or not applicable. I think this will surprise any of you to know that mostly that answer is no, that it's not just for transfer students. So I will go on to poll question three. It's our third and final question is that you offer a leadership series for women students only or female identifying students. So yes, no, or not applicable. Okay. 70% of you have responded. So I'll give that two more seconds. All right, I'll end that poll and share the results. And again, no, it looks like you're offering largely um, your leadership series for a broad group of students largely that's not just a first year, that's not just to female students and not just to transfer students. So thanks for sharing that. I think it's good from time to time just to see kind of what trends are existing and who you're in community with and what they're engaged in on their campus as well. So thanks for sharing that. I will stop that share now. I do want to share with you um, the, a definition that leadership Leadership subscribes to as it comes to leadership. We know that there are lots of definition, definitions of leadership out there, but leadership defines leadership as um, involving living in a state of possibility, making a commitment to a vision, developing relationships to move vision into action, and sustaining a high level of integrity. Effective leadership takes place in the context of a community and results in a more equitable society. So um, I, before I move on to our next slide, I do just want to comment. I do see your comment here in the chat, Jim, um, that there are others on campus that are providing leadership programs specifically for women. And I think that's true, right? There perhaps are different offices or departments that are specifically targeting those different groups on campus. So that makes sense as we think about your responses to that last question. So I would like to invite Tom to engage with you from this point and just share some of his own reflections on leadership education. So again, please use that chat box um, for any questions or comments or resources that might come up during the week or during the session, the week. Oh my gosh, we probably could talk for a week on this topic, couldn't we? Um, before I do totally turn the reins over to Tom, I did just wanna share that we are recording this session just as we've recorded all the sessions for this week. We will email everyone who has registered for the sessions this week, um, this afternoon, with links to all the recordings from the session. So if you'll have those in case you have colleagues that wanted to attend and couldn't, then you'll be able to um, share those links with them as well. So with that, Tom, I'd like to turn things over to you as we go on into what it's like to support leadership educators. Thank you, thank you, Abby. I was just sitting here reflecting on um, the good experiences I've had through leadership, through working with leadership educators. And the thing that's a common thread that I've just observed as I was reflecting on all that and thinking about our time today is that leadership educators are generally concerned about a student's entire experience. You know, some of the best times I've had as a Totally, quite honestly, for now, for I can't believe I'm going to say this is my 16th year as a co lead. And I think I look just as good as I did 16 years ago. No, I guess that's not true. Um, more gray hair um, is that we have a, a broad concern for students and their well being. And so um, I come at this as someone who's been fortunate to um, supervise both directly and indirectly some amazing. Uh, leadership educators. I've collaborated with a lot of amazing uh, leadership educators. So as I reflected on our time today, I just wanted to share ways we can support. And so whether you are a leadership educator and you 
want to express your needs to those who support you, or if you're someone who supervises and the responsible for the leadership of leadership educators. I, I just thought these were some important points that I've come across. And so when I think about acknowledging their essential role within the student experience, I find that a lot of the student needs that might fall outside of the traditional boundaries of leadership education, our leadership educators, they know. Um, Abby, I was telling you that I just spent the past four and a half hours with our student government executive board retreat. And that retreat was facilitated by um, our person who oversees student leadership on our campus. And while there was a focus on teaching some leadership skills, the conversation really talked about the student experience. And I couldn't have found a better example about how the work that we do is not isolated by organizational boundaries or by disciplines. Um, and I have found that in past experiences, I've relied on that wisdom and experience. And so I would hope that those of us who are supervising, leading our leadership educators, that we're, we're having them part of the overall conversation. So, um, and that kind of leads to my second point, accept and affirm their insight on the student experience. Um, you know, when I think back to maybe 20, 25 years ago, as I was learning about leadership development, I learned about the social change model and I read all these great books and those those books and those sources of literature, while incredibly valuable, tended to talk about leadership leadership as if it was one finite thing. And we know that's not really the case. And so why do we take our professionals and we want to limit them to their box on the org chart? Um, and so the student experience is certainly goes beyond um, just the, the learning and development that students are going through to be better leaders and better human beings. Um, it, it's, it's integral to the student experience. And so um, I've been very intentional about seeking guidance and providing a larger platform for the leadership educators in my own life. And I can say that in my own experience, we've been better for it. Um, and so this next piece, um, add and amplify their work within the broader context of student engagement. Um, and I want to give a real concrete example of kind of where that shows up for me. Um, you know, we all have committees and large initiatives in our work where we might tend to tap those individuals who already oversee a larger portfolio of things. And realizing that some of the most talented people we have are our leadership educators because of all the folks we have, they actually, they study this stuff. They know how it works. Um, and so I, I've, I've found it important to plug them in. So this is like real talk. I'm not making this up. I didn't, I didn't do this for today. Um, I got a phone call from our director of our university foundation and we have a scholarship that is um, established by my predecessor, previous vice president who retired. And naturally, as a true student affairs VP, the scholarship is for um, students who reflect um, exemplary engagement and co-curricular involvement, like straight out of, of a textbook, right? And so the this my colleague, director of the foundation, was asking, well, how do we how do we find this information? How do we look at our database and who would be the right person? And my thought was, well, there's only one person that comes to mind for me. And again, it's the person who oversees our leadership development on our campus. Uh, and there are certain, certainly other people who may carry the um, role of doing leadership education, um, but the person who kind of oversees those efforts and who leads those efforts and who does it on day to day um, and we're, I, I would say we're a smaller campus. We have about 10,000 students. Um, and so we don't have multiple, we don't have a five or 10 person um, department of, of folks, but that's the person. And so when I explained how we could do it and I explained our student engagement um, uh, 
computer uh, information system the thing we track all of our involvements in. Uh, when I talked about curricular transcripts we could generate, I said, that's the person. Um, and the important piece is that person's title may be leadership, but they are engaged in a larger process of student engagement. And I think we often think about student engagement as just programming and then leadership is a real critical role in that. Mm -hmm. um, this next one, accept their willingness to participate in the leadership of the department, division, institution. And I, um, I come at this as having worked with a person who had um, lots of institutional knowledge in, in a past institution, a past position, someone who had been an institution at that time for about 25 years, had been an undergrad. And I was surprised at how this person was often limited to just overseeing leadership development and not being asked to be involved in, in, in greater efforts across university and not being asked to be a part of um, some of the decision making. And I, I changed that fortunately and my other colleagues understood, hey, we have an incredible resource. Um, and so we decided, hey, how about we have this person chair this particular initiative? And so we actually changed the way in which we did um, our orientation, the way in which we did some of our immersive leadership experiences. Um, and by tapping into their expertise, we were able to draw more involvement, more collaboration across the institution. Um, and so uh, that's what kind of what I share, share when I think about people's willingness to engage, participate in leadership across division institutions. I've never had anyone, um, and I've had a chance to do this, do this several times, I've never had someone turn me down. Um, in fact, some of you may be familiar with the uh, study called the Multi-Institutional Study of Leadership. And it's something I'm very familiar with. It was part of my, actually my dissertation is based on it. I was the first project manager and we decided to implement that here. Um, and instead of asking our, um, our research folks to take the lead, I actually asked um, our own internal assessment person and our leadership person to take the lead. And that was probably a unique combination. So um, it's always kind of interesting to see who's willing to chip in, right? And like what their skill sets will contribute to any given project. I think that's great. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm noticing your comment, Abby, in the chat. Um, yeah, I, th I think those of us who are leaders and certainly those of you who may want to provide some feedback to those leading you, um, I think it's important that there's acknowledgement, right, of what people can contribute. That's, that's, and I think it's okay to ask for that acknowledgement if we're not receiving it. Yeah. I agree, because I think we probably have all had that supervisor or leader that gives you those broad like, oh, you're doing a great job. And it doesn't mean as much when you have that leader that says, I really appreciate the way you led this specific thing with this specific set of skills. Right. And as I hear you talk about how you're amplifying that work, that's what I'm hearing you say. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. And, and I, the word amplifying is so, so accurate. And mm -hmm. I think it's it's about giving that positive feedback, maybe being the mirror for that person to point out the good, not to use a a leader shape analogy, but be the mirror. See, I've been known this way too long. Um, be the mirror, right? And yeah. say, I have witnessed you doing this, this, and this, and you may not be aware of this, but I'm aware of it. Yeah. And I, I want to acknowledge what you're doing, and I want to amplify this good work in ways that others can recognize it and in ways that will benefit our students. Yeah, it feels good to be seen for your work. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I totally interrupted your flow there. But no, I like this. This is more natural for me. You know that I am, this is, this is great. Yeah. Uh, but you know, all that, you know, just again, listening to what you're saying, Abby, it reminds me that our leadership educators have so much to offer because in order to do what they do, they have to have an understanding of, a broad understanding actually of students and their development 
um, and human beings in general, they have to have a deeper level of understanding. Um, and they also have to be more aware of what's happening across the institution. Yeah, I agree. Thanks for that. Um, and so the next one here, um, advocate for meaningful collaboration with other departments. I think there are needs that other departments have and there are students who are engaging other departments who could benefit from what our leadership educators have to offer. Um, at a past institution many, many years ago, um, we had a first year early immersion program and it was designed for new students who wanted to have a chance to learn about leadership and, and, gain, and, and gain some skills and maybe get a head start on how to be involved on campus. So it was pretty common that students would pass leadership experience in high school, but choose to participate in this experience. Now, ironically, this experience was largely led by folks working in housing. And I'm not gonna cast any shade on my housing peeps, right? Because I was one of them. But I was also someone who brought some leadership um, education experience, but we noticed that it was missing something. And until we pulled in our, our leadership educators into that experience, and then it got exponentially better. Now, this was something that was put in place probably at this point, about 25 years ago. Fast forward, to maybe five years ago, that same program has grown to now it's a Hallmark program. In fact, an entire leadership um, center has been built around it, um, but it, it took bringing in an expertise. Again, it's one of those things where that collaboration wasn't happening, even though these are, in this case, these are people who were in the same division, they were, literally down the hall from each other. Um, but we didn't think about, gee, here's an opportunity to collaborate. And so currently on our own campus, as we are working to broaden our leadership offering for students, um, we're thinking of ways that we can connect with academic departments. We're thinking of ways, and this may already be happening on other campuses for sure, um, I know this is probably more common on larger campuses, but we're finding ways to pull in other departments. Um, in fact, we're also finding ways to um, leverage this for the community. And so one of the concrete ways we've done this is that we've linked um, our person who, who does our leadership education on our campus. And that person is now in direct contact with our government liaison for our state system. Because we thought, well, what a, what a great opportunity to combine civic engagement, leadership, and in this case, we're gonna pull in some community service in this opportunity. And, and for this person in this role, again, I, I, I feel like I need to put a picture of my colleague I'm talking about all this time. Um, he reports to my boss, the president for, the, for this. Um, and so again, I, I don't think I can stress enough the opportunities when we just take the time to take the risk. Yeah. And um, so I, I just wanna share that one piece. And I think it, it comes to something to that we all believe we don't always engage in is that knowing that more minds make things better yeah. um, and that we don't have to be bounded by just our titles and our responsibilities. For sure. And I think too, um, Tom, as we think about those poll questions that we started with, right, about it's not necessarily that the Department of Leadership Educators is the only one that's providing leadership programming on campus. We see that, right, that there's, and Jim, I'm sorry to, to call on you again, but in your comment in the chat, Jim, from a while back about there are other um, places on campus that provide leadership programming specifically for women. That's true on other campuses too, where this office provides leadership programming specifically for first year students or right that it's it's divided up and it's kind of the sharing of expertise on campus. Um, and I think we see lots of places where that works really well. Yeah, yeah. And 
I think it, it kind of ties into this next item, you know, the acknowledging of um, helping others to acknowledge the body of rigorous scholarly work that guides their practice. So part of the acknowledgement that sometimes can open up the door for more collaboration and more acknowledgement um, about expertise and skill sets is recognizing that this is a discipline. Um, and so I, I find that uh, it's part of my job to kind of echo that wherever I can um, and, and even tie it into other disciplines. And so um, one of the things that we've done at our institution um, in the past few years, we've combined at least programmatically and, and also organizationally, we've combined our leadership education with multicultural affairs and, and um, Greek affairs. And so they now all exist within one physical space instead of being divided up among multiple buildings. Um, but I think for those of us who who, who engage in this on a day-to-day -day basis, it's important that we let other folks know that this is not just an endeavor based on reliving our positive past college experiences and trying to promulgate that with the students we work with, but there is a body of knowledge that guides what we do. And it's rich and it's deep and it's meaningful and students value it. Um, and I, I find that when we do that, we get more buy-in. Um, we get faculty, for example, who might want us to present in their classes because it fits with what they're doing. Um, the last piece here, and I'm thoughtful of time, and I certainly welcome any comments in the chat or questions in the chat, um, and please have you stop me at any time. Don't hesitate. Um, we have to apply justice, equity, diversity, inclusion into their work. One of my greatest critiques of leadership education early in my career was that it's going to be, can I just, I'm going to be really real because we're on Zoom and I know it's being recorded and then someone's going to watch this on YouTube and call me because I said this, but leadership seemed a very white male thing. Can I say that? Um, as, as a product of the early 90s in terms of my own undergraduate education, um, and where I first even learned about the concept of leadership, it seemed very white. And for a long time, it seemed very white, very male, very cisgendered, um, very straight, very, very US citizen. Um, it seemed to tap into all of the dominant identities that we can think of. And I had this notion that in order to be a leader, I had to have a, um, a square, a square jaw, you know, um, I had to be at least six foot two and I'm not six foot anything, not even on my best day. Um, and so I found that leadership educators get this, but we better support them by helping others understand that justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion are integral to the work of leadership. And when I think about the leadership definition of leadership, you can't have that definition without incorporating those particular values. Yeah. I, um, Tom, if I could interject, I was just having a conversation this week with Tanya Williams and I apologize to her as she's listening to this later. And if I'm um, mashing up her words more than she intended, then I greatly apologize. But we were talking about how we're so good at defining but not so good at putting into practice. And so as I hear you talk about what leadership looked like, what that person looked like that defined leadership, we're real good at defining it and saying diversity inclusion is important, justice and equity is important, and then not rewarding it, not role modeling it, not showing what it looks like when it's done well, not showing the value and importance of it in the work that we're doing, then defining it well doesn't mean much, right? Yes. So all yeah. credit to Dr. Tanya Williams for that <laughs> comment. <laughs> oh, what, what an awesome human right there. I mean, yeah. 
Don't get me started. <laughs> that could be its own separate one of these, just <laughs> talking about how awesome uh, Tanya is. Wow. I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think in, as we can we can transition to the next set of slides because it really ties in. Um, this last point ties into the next point about what students need. Um, Tom, if I could say real quick, I see sure. Jim's comment to a resource in the chat box here and thinking about um, Kathy Guthrie's work on changing the narrative, the socially just leadership education. And I appreciate that resource that's being shared here too. So thank you for that, Jim. Thank you, Jim. That's awesome. I need to, I need to look at that. Mm -hmm. I need to read that book. Yeah. So here's your next slide. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so when I, I've, I've learned this, uh, I learned some hard lessons, right? So some lessons we learn, they're pleasant because we, we, we get to sit around a circle or now sit across the screen and we talk about things, but oh, wow, this, so now I learned this. And sometimes we learn it because in the moment we're like, oh goodness, something has gone wrong and I wasn't prepared for this. And now what do I do? Um, and so I think students have taught me very much and so have so have the leadership educators in my life um, how much students need to understand how to assess in group dynamics so i think assessing group dynamics i really realized that i had a typo there but um, on how to assess group dynamics right so um i remember being part of retreat that i was invited to um, and i remember I was asked to just facilitate one piece of the retreat and it was actually a retreat with the programming board and it was supposed to be a an exercise on better communication and I noticed how much this group struggled to communicate in this little activity that I was doing with, with a Mr. Potato Head. So one person had their eyes covered and everyone else had to tell this person how to construct the Mr. Potato Head based on the instructions I had given. And I noticed just how much stress this exercise caused and the frustration they were experiencing. And it was bringing up other stuff. And the person who had asked me to be there happened to also be the person, our director, of leadership education and student activities. And um, we process that saying, you know, one of the things we have to do is to teach our student leaders how to assess group dynamics. Because had that lesson been taught, they would have been in a position to avoid some of the issues that had accumulated over several months. Um, and today, as I talk to my colleagues, who are responsible for advising student groups um, or who are responsible for administering some level of leadership education, they talk about how our students more than ever need coaching on group dynamics. And so it's not just can you execute this function, but can you assess what's working, what's not working among members of a group? Can you assess the roles um, that people are taking on and can you assess where there's friction within individuals and how to work at that. Um, and that really relates to the next item, guidance on navigating intra and interpersonal conflicts. Um, now, I don't want to be the person who says that because of social media and cell phones, the whole, whole world is coming to a crashing end because at one point we didn't have cell phones, social media, so therefore we didn't have conflict. So I remember the era prior to cell phones and social media. I remember that the only way we could communicate was pretty much by paper because even email didn't exist. We had all the conflict stuff there too. I guess that's good to know, right? That it didn't start because of cell phones and social media. It's been happening for a while. <laughs> and for a long time. Um, it's always been here. It just showed up in um, and different mediums. But I think um, students have taught me the importance of having guidance. Um, I shared earlier that I've been part of um, our Student Government Association Executive Board Retreat this morning. And um, I'm very close with my SGA Executive Board, even though, again, I'm not their advisor. Um, 
I'm, I'm just someone who finds it incredibly valuable to be very connected to what they're doing so I can offer support. But I can think of the many times and the many meetings, and now I'm, if, well, I'll say this and take the risk and don't watch this on YouTube, um, I'll suffer the consequences then. But I know I have helped mediate conflict between individuals, sometimes responding to a text message that they're sending to my phone as they're engaging in some conflict over the group me. I know that's some high level stuff, right? That's you got so group, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You got group me going on, but the, the back channel is, is the old fashioned text message. Mm -hmm. True story, I'm not making this up. Yeah. But part of it is providing that guidance. So not just saying, oh, you're right. Oh, you should say this, but saying, hey, what's coming up for you? Because I'm noticing this reaction. What's really coming up for you around this? And what's keeping you from addressing it? So again, I have since taken some of these lessons that I, that again, I've been, I've been the, the learner in all this. I'm not the teacher, um, but I've tried to share this in a more broad sense with other colleagues. And of course, I'm talking within a student affairs context, but I've shared this with other colleagues to say, hey, you ever thought about maybe teaching your student staff? If you have, in this case, thinking about RAs or thinking about um, student athletes, um, athletics is part of my portfolio as well, and teaching folks how to navigate those conflicts. Um, the next one here really probably ties into the last point on the previous slide, you know, the rejection of traditional concepts of leadership. Um, students don't want to subscribe to this, but again, um, it's the leadership educators in my life who helped me understand it even more than what I wanted to, because I have to admit, I even have approached this from a, I'll say a neo-traditional, but it may be a little bit better than what was taught in the 80s and 90s and before, but certainly not always current of today. And so I think it's really, of it's worth noting that um, we have to work to reject those traditional concepts, even among our colleagues and educate them. And our students are the ones who are making that really clear. And, and so are our leadership educators who are working with our students to make it clear that um, we don't have to subscribe to this traditional notion whatsoever. That's so valuable. And I think it's so hard to do too, right? When those um, concepts are all around us and our teachings and, and how we talk about leadership, it's hard to reject those things. And it's hard to find what the other concepts are, what the non-traditional or neo-traditional concepts are. So I, I really appreciate that comment, Tom. Yeah, because it's, it's so far beyond position. It's so far yeah. beyond role, mm -hmm. title, mm -hmm. um, because again, going back to the leadership definition of leadership, it doesn't necessarily require someone to have a position or a place on some two-dimensional chart. Yeah. Yep. You know, Tom, I often give this example of my, I'm sorry if I could interject, my nephew, please, please. when one of my nephews was in the third grade, he did not get chosen as his team captain of his basketball team and it nearly wrecked him. Um, because in the third grade, those things are very important. And I asked him, do you think you could still be seen as a leader on your team? And he said, oh, right. Because at that age, we think that like there's a team captain and then there are members of the team. And we forget that you can still be seen as a leader. You can still be seen as the one who shows up first and leaves last and puts in all the hard work and right. We forget those things. And I'm glad that it eight years old in third grade, that that was a light bulb that turned on for him. <laughs> How fortunate though, that you helped provide the spark for that light bulb for your nephew who's in the third grade and not in his third year of college yet. Well, when we're surrounded by the language of leadership, I think we can't help ourselves, but to talk about it often, so. <laughs> That's fantastic, but what a powerful lesson Right, and, and, and even to help our students understand that sometimes given the dynamics of a situation, it might be even more meaningful and have a greater influence if they're leading without 
the title or position. Right. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> oh, no, it's a good example. You know, I'm dealing with a good example of that right now um, at my institution that's not necessarily student leadership related, but certainly related to community, um, related to COVID. And um, I, I witnessed without giving too much exam of an example, because this is on YouTube. So, but the powerful example is this we needed to kind of get something moving. We, we had a situation where things were stuck and we need to get them unstuck. And no traditional path was gonna get there. Yet leadership um, and the form of a simple phone call from just a concerned but um, respected person was kind of the, the, is what we needed. It was the right push to get things moving within moments. And so, you know, that's a great example of how we can help our students understand that um, we don't have to be locked into these traditional views of how things get done. Um, the next one here probably is something that's, that's really close to my heart, support for self-efficacy and authenticity. Um, and I'm reminded of the story of Wizard of Oz and we may have all kinds of issues with the Wizard of Oz. Um, I didn't get the whole flying monkeys and the green witch and, and the, the fact that she could never take a bath because she melted. Um, if we can get past all that, um, the fact that most of Dorothy's journey was one of self-efficacy and authenticity. If I can get past social identity, I can get past some of the really antiquated ways of understanding people from the mid thirties and just think about that part of the story. Um, it was one of a journey of self-efficacy and authenticity for all four people on the journey. Um, and the fact that all along Dorothy could go home if she's clicked her heels. Now, at the same time, why didn't Glenda tell her that at the beginning? That's a whole other story. Um, why she had to go through all that. Could have told her, right, do the shoes, click your heels, go home, be home in time for lunch. You're changing this show for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and if you haven't seen The Wizard of Oz, I apologize if I spoiled it. I didn't really totally spoil it. Um, but the authenticity and self-efficacy is something that our students need more of, and they need that support beyond just leadership education, but it's certainly where I have found the most uh, acknowledgement and effort to bring that out as part of the leadership development experience. And it's something that um, certainly I, I've been fortunate to be have that be part of what I've been exposed to in my time. Um, and then broader perspectives on what on leadership and what it means to be a leader. I think there are a lot of images today on particularly today in the past, I don't know, eight days on what leadership means. Um, and I, I found that it's been our leadership educators, particularly ones in my own life that have helped students understand and even have dialogue around good and bad examples of leadership and, and what leadership means beyond simply executing a particular role um, and how it is also tied to service, how it's tied to justice. Um, and the definitions don't have to be narrow. And um, we've kind of embraced that as we work with our own students and as we have worked to integrate notions of leadership with identity, as I shared a few moments ago, this idea of having what is now we call our Center for Multicultural Student Leadership and Engagement. Um, it's it is still new. I mean, it's, it's new, I think it's maybe three or four years old. Um, but again, I, I think it's it's, been the leadership educators who have brought that perspective in and who've challenged those notions. Um, and then I think the last point probably ties into the last point from the previous slide. Um, knowledge and skill building around the dynamics of power, privilege, social identity, advantage, marginalized identities within any conversations about leadership. And if we aren't adding that, that piece, then we really are, our conversations are lacking. Um, 
because in many ways, leadership has been aligned with power and um, fair or unfair. And we've seen example, we see example of that in our own society that leadership is aligned with power and not aligned with service, positive influence, positive change, not aligned with imagining a world with unlimited possibilities, having health regard for the impossible. Um, and so I, 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 I put that there because I think it's such a critical piece in what I've continued to learn and, and what I hope to teach others around leadership. Yeah, thank you for that, Tom. I, I really appreciate that point and I completely agree with you too that we are, um, we're missing out on the full picture if we're leaving um, these these points out of conversations around leadership. They're absolutely the parts of leadership that we need to be talking about more. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. And so it, this gives us a chance to, and, the, and I certainly have witnessed this firsthand, it gives us a chance just to change the entire way we approach teaching our students a, about leadership. Um, and I've, I've been fortunate enough to have even seen the way in which leadership has changed the curriculum many times. So when I moved to Indiana, Pennsylvania, almost two years ago, I had the pleasure maybe of looking back on all of my past manuals, my co-lead manuals that I did not throw away because that was too sentimental even though I didn't need to hold on to them. And I forget sitting at my desk at home at our old house, looking through those manuals and tracking what's changed, tracking how much day two and day three has changed in particular, um, and really was just thrilled at how much the curriculum has evolved for the Institute over the past at least in this case, I was looking at 15 years worth of manuals, probably six manuals across that time frame. Um, that we have to have that those pieces as part of any conversation. If we're not talking about marginalized and advantaged identities, then we really should not be talking about leadership. And um, and for me, it's really been students who have been reinforcing that lesson and affirming that lesson. Um, for me and, and have challenged even my colleagues to make sure that we are applying that lesson to what we do. So. Thank you for that, Tom. That's very kind of you. Thank you. And I agree. I think that those conversations have to continue um, and not just the leadership curriculum, but we all have to evolve in our own understanding and in our own examination and our own reflection too about what do those identities mean for us and how are we from what identity are we entering into that conversation um, what does our power and privilege look like as we're considering that conversation with another person right like how are we using or checking ourselves on are we using that power and privilege or are we trying to enter into the conversation by seeing ourselves as a leader or yeah yeah, thank you for that. I think that um, our own examinations only make us better if we're able to be honest and genuine with that and continue in our learning. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love the way you said our own examinations, right? That self reflection mm -hmm. and doing that, not just the one time we were told to do it in an activity, but to do it continually, right? Yeah. No, I really like that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, maybe we should, I think we have one more slide. Am I? Yeah. Some guiding questions. Yeah. Um, so what do leadership educators have to teach us and, and what can we do to bring leadership educators to the center of our, of our work with students? Um, and so I guess maybe folks can reply in the chat if they feel so moved. Um, but certainly these questions were on my mind as I just put together these slides. And I totally don't claim that these are the only relevant points, but 
they certainly uh, resonated with me um, and resonated with sort of how I have kind of gone about my work. Um, and even though my daily job doesn't have to put me in the mix um, of working directly with students, but the, my work with my leadership educator colleagues have really compelled me to make sure I stay connected with students. Um, and, and probably, um, kind of ground me in, in, in this work um, and, and give me a lot more meaning um, in, in the work I do beyond what I think I would get if I didn't have this as part of my experience. That's so good. And I think that that is all wrapped up into this idea that we're all teachers and learners too, right? So as leadership educators, we're teaching, we're also learning throughout that cycle and sharing those ideas is so important. And um, thank you for that question. I think that's the, the question almost feels rhetorical. <laughs> I think just in thinking about like, what don't leadership educators have to teach us if we're listening, if we're paying attention, if we're around them. And I think to engaging with them in those academic venues, like the conferences that we attend, the sessions that we sit in on and listen to the panel discussions. I think that we're definitely learning in those ways in that more like academic and structured sense. But I think there are also these really informal and unstructured ways that some of the things that you've shared with us, like how are we paying attention to the things that are um, the folks that we supervise or the people that we're around, the things that they're interested in, the things that they wanna to contribute to and how do we champion that? How do we continue to help encourage and support them in those ways too? I think those are the more like loose and informal and unstructured ways that we're, that leadership educators are teaching us to do better too. Yeah. Yeah, cause I think it's easy to get caught up around delineating roles responsibilities and opportunities again based on the org chart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not recognizing the talent that exists throughout an organization and what folks have to teach us if we simply were to give them the opportunity to do so and they're and they're willing to do so but do we think about providing the space for them to do so mm -hmm. um, and for those individuals who are the gatekeepers and do and have the positional roles where they are making decisions about who gets to lead, who gets to take on a role, just to challenge those notions of who gets to do that and, and make it more broad. Um, and not, not necessarily thinking that someone who may be at one place in the org chart wouldn't have a division level responsibility that may put them in a position of leading a group of individuals who organizationally may be positioned in a quote unquote higher arc at least based on the hierarchy we, we create or we impose, yeah. um, we got to get beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. Those structures are a little too firm sometimes, aren't they? <laughs> they are. They are. And, you know, putting together an org chart on a two-dimensional piece of paper, um, while we do so because that's the medium we work in, if we only conceptualize organizations the same way they represent on paper we're, li we're missing out on talent yeah and i like to think they're far more three-dimensional and they're really based on roles um related to the content of the work not roles related to who reports to who and um not related to the hierarchy or the power dimensions that are within the chart yeah yeah Tom, thank you for this. <laughs> I um, I really appreciate, I know our chat box has been a little quiet. I imagine that like me, there are a lot of people on the other side of the screen that are saying, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for validating what I've been seeing at my own work or the questions that I've been trying to answer in my own workspace and the people that I've been trying to collaborate with and um, the new versions of leadership and the new lessons of leadership that I've been trying to role model to you. So Tom, I thank you for this. I thank you for the expertise that you've brought to this and for the wisdom that you've shared with us on these conversations as well. Um, I hope friends, I know I've shared with you at the start of our time together today that we are recording this. I will share the recording out with either Kristen Young or I will share the recordings out with everyone who's attended all the sessions from this week. 
so you can continue to absorb and um, observe and consider um, from the questions that Tom has shared with us and from the rest of our um, series from the rest of this week as well. I did want to share with you all too, just in, again, thanking our friend Tom for all the work that you've done and all the work you continue to do and how you share that with us too. You're so generous in that spirit and so kind in the way you share that. And I really appreciate and value that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to share too, I know for folks that might be new to learning about leadership, or if you came to us in this way um, today, that we do have a couple of different program offerings, a couple of different ways in which we grow that community of people like Tom and like all of you who lead with integrity and have a healthy disregard for the impossible. If you have additional questions for us or um, things that you'd like to follow up with, this is how you get in touch with us, leadership.org. You'll find our contact information on that website um, or any almost any social media um, platform that's out there. We've got an account there so you can reach out to us that way as well. Um, but I do, again, I just want to thank Tom and thank you all for joining us today and talking about um, what do we learn from leadership educators and how we lead them and how we work with them and who we are as them. So um, thank you for that work, Tom. Thank you all for joining us here today. And I hope you all have a great rest of your Friday and a great weekend. Thank you, everybody. Very good. We've got a great day of service coming up on Monday as we approach MLK Day too. And so I hope folks are thinking about how they might spend that um, day of service, perhaps to leadership educators or perhaps to others in your community as well. So thank you for that. Very good. Thanks, friends. Anyone staying on to ask a question? Maybe you've been working up the nerve to ask a question this hour and now <laughs> as participants are dwindling down, maybe you have a question for us. If you wanna turn your camera or microphone on to do that, you're welcome to. All right, I'll go ahead and stop recording then now um, so that we can...